Uh, a warm welcome to everybody in Kerala. Um, I guess um, you'll have to keep your microphones on mute. Then we can start. Today's topic is what lies beneath. Um, an idea about composite theory, the science behind it. Because I feel that in my time, um, when Thank we you, Dr. Pai Rizal, for those kind words of introduction, we never really and, learned it. Uh, warm welcome to, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. So, what exactly is a resin composite? In its simplest terms, it's a synthetic resin polymer and it's become an aesthetic replacement for silver amalgam. And the reason why it has become a replacement for amalgam is because it bonds about composite. This is the hallmark of the science behind it. Because I feel that now let's look at the physical properties that we really don't look into much when we look at really learn and today have a very very high compressive strength, ranging from about 250 to 350 megapascals. They have a very low tensile strength, ranging from 50 to 90 megapascals. And this is the number that you need to remember. The compressive strength is very high. The tensile strength is pretty low. So this means that when you make a preparation for composite, you have to take this into regard. But generally, that is not done. If we look at this particular preparation, we will remember this from our second BDS, from third BDS, from final BDS, from internship. And maybe when we, jo when we join PG, we make it a little minimal. But the fact remains that the style of preparation hasn't changed much since Black's cavity preparation style. Now, if you look at this particular picture over here, you will see that it's still a box. And this particular picture over here is still a box. Now, this particular design was designed for amalgam in mind. When you design a restoration with that kind of cavity preparation, then you will have failure that happens at the joints. And this joint is something what we call, or what we have realized to be as a tension joint. These joints that you see on the failed amalgam restoration are all tension joints. Therefore, there may be something wrong with the kind of preparation that we've been giving all these years. This I picked up from a textbook. As you can see, the prescribed design hasn't changed much. It still looks like an amalgam class two preparation. And when it's filled, it looks like this. But this is how it looks on the day you complete it. After this, you will find that there are tension joints generated. And because of this, failure will occur in time in these places. Because as I said earlier, composite is not very good in tension. It's very good in compression, not very good in tension. So, <clears throat> The most common failures or the most common complaints that we have of composite failure is that margin staining and finally dislodgement or Okay, um, so composite failure can be seen as margin staining or dislodgement or fracture. And this is both an aesthetic and an engineering problem. Actually, both of these are related
Right. So today we will be talking a little bit more on the engineering aspect of composite restorations. That is what lies beneath. That is what the platform that you are creating for your composite restoration. How good is that platform? What lies underneath that composite restoration? That's what we're going to be talking about. So the old design, if we look at it, is very dentine centric. You have to cut into dentine because amalgam required you to cut into dentine. You couldn't remain in enamel and relies on good dentine bond strength. So if you're cutting into dentine and if your restoration has a lot of dentine visible, then the bond strength between dentine and the composite plays a very, very important feature in the retentiveness and the longevity of your composite restoration. The enamel bevel that was prescribed was very, very small, not much. But in a sense, all the classes of cavities from one, two, three, and five were all boxes, just placed in different positions. But if you look at it, they're all boxes with high amount of dentine exposure, very little enamel exposure. This kind of design, unfortunately, is not very good for composite. And this is something that we've learned. Because we were making boxes, there were certain consequences. All boxes have a very high C factor. Now I won't go into detail on what C factor is because I'm sure a lot of people have told you over the years of what the C factor is. You would have studied it and you would have known the importance of a low C factor in a restoration design. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So from an engineering point of view, if your C factor of your restoration is low, it's very good for composite. If your C factor is high, it's not good for composite. And in order to reduce the C factor, layering of composites became mandatory. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is this junction at this Top. At the occlusal junction, it's an almost 90 degree butt joint, almost 90 degree butt joint. Now this is a tension joint. If you create a joint like this on the occlusal surface of a composite restoration, that junction is going to fail in time because composites do not play well under tension. Right. Then came the bulk fill concept, which means let's, let me introduce a composite that can be cured up to at least five millimeters in depth. And this is just a product catalog picture that I took. What I want you to train your attention to is the cavity design. The cavity design in all three situations is a large box. And the top is a 90 degree butt joint at the occlusal level. It doesn't matter what composite you use. Even if you use a bulk fill composite with this kind of design of restoration, it is bound for failure. Moreover, because you're going to be bulk filling at five millimeters or more in a box, there is an extremely high shrinkage stress that develops. And this can lead to failure, marginal leakage, etc., sensitivity and whatnot. So, I would say that these kind of restoration designs are obsolete and one has to embrace a new paradigm, a new shift into looking at composite restorations from a different angle. It is obsolete because A, all these restoration designs were designed for amalgam and then slightly modified for composite because of the so-called minimal invasive dentistry that came about. The minimal invasive dentistry was designed for glass animals, not for composite. But we took the idea and we said, hey, since composite bonds to the tooth structure, why not just make our restorations a smaller version of the old blacks amalgam type of preparation. And this kind of preparation totally disregards the property of composite. And just to jog your memory again, the property that composites play well under compressive stress, they play very badly under tensile stress. And all the designs of composite preparations so far that I've seen in textbooks 
have very, very high tensile joints. And that's a problem. So the junctions are the weak spots of a restoration, both microbiologically, biologically, physically, chemically, in whatever respect you look at it, the junction of a restoration between one material and the other is always going to be the weak spot. Now, if you create a tension joint, this joint will fail faster than a compression joint. So what is the difference between a tension joint and a compression joint? And for that regard, I'm just going to take you to carpentry, which has been my pet subject to pursue during lockdown. I've done a lot of carpentry and I've learned this firsthand. When you join two pieces of wood together, you have many, many options. I've just put two examples in front of you. One is called the butt joint, which is on the left side. That's the tension joint. The other one is a half lap joint or a lap joint, which is under compression. Now, what happens when forces act on these joints? The tension joint will tend to move away when forces act occlusally. So think of it as an occlusal surface. The opposing tooth is putting pressure. If you have a tension joint, the movement will be away. This is the movement. Whereas on the right side, when you have a compression joint that is created, this piece of enamel or composite or whatever it is, is going to be pressed against the tooth structure and it does not come off. So that's the difference that has to be made when it comes to tooth preparation. Move away from creating tension joints, move towards creating compression joints. Another aspect of the newer kind of um, uh, composite preparations is that we've become slow to realize the power of the enamel bond strength. For those of you who've had orthodontic treatment or do orthodontic treatment, I've had the uh, fortune to remove a bracket after one or one and a half years of it being inside a patient's mouth. You will remember this. You will realize that removing a bracket is not an easy task. You have a special instrument for it and still it's a little difficult. And yes, you can see that wince in the patient's eye as you remove the bracket because the bracket is stuck so hard to uncut etched enamel. And it stayed like that for one and a half years under tension with a wire applying pressure on it. That is the power of the enamel bond. And that is what you have to harness every time you do a composite restoration. Just remember that the enamel bond is very strong. The dentine bond, no orthodontist, I promise you this, no orthodontist, will bond a bracket to dentine. They will never do it. They know this better than us. They know the power of the enamel bond. That's why they harness the enamel bond. And that's why we as restorative dentists have to start changing our preparation to harness all this enamel that is there. The greater the enamel spread, the more stronger your composite restoration becomes and the more retentive it remains. So what's new? These new kind of composite restorations are designed for composite. It has been designed with composite in mind. It's moved away from tension joints and it's a high compressive joint on the occlusal surface. And thirdly, it relies more on enamel and less on dentine. So that means it doesn't make a difference what bonding agent you use which generation bonding agent you use. There's always a big confusion in dentine bonding. Which should I use, the fifth or the sixth or the seventh? Should I use all in one? Should I use three separates? Should I add total etch? Should I self etch? Should I selective etch? The beauty about using enamel is that it's not very picky and choosy. Bonding to enamel is very, very simple. I mean, when you use pit and fissure sealants, you don't even use a bonding agent. That means a flowable composite can stick to enamel without a bonding agent. That's the predictability and the ease of the enamel bonding. So we should not be complicating the matter by relying on dentine bonding because the truth of the matter is dentine bonding is unreliable. 
the bond strengths that you get on day one, if you compare the same bond strengths on day 30, day 60, day 90, you will find a gradual deterioration. And after about six months or so, the dentine bond strength is about what? 40 to 50% of the original bond strength. That is not a reliable substrate to bond to. You cannot, you cannot rely on dentine and you should not move, change your view, start looking at enamel and start using the enamel. A professor of mine told me that it's extension for retention. Switching the earlier one, which was extension for prevention. Today, we use enamel, extend our preparations onto enamel for retention. So let me just show you pictorially what modern class one, two, three, four, five cavities look like for class one you have to make it look like a saucer. Note that we no longer use boxes. We no longer make boxes. We stay away from boxes as far as possible because composites don't like to be placed in boxes. They like open spaces. They like surfaces. So a class one cavity style is now not a box, but a wide saucer. And if you see this black margin extension, you can see it, creeping onto the enamel surface. And this is the compression joint that you create. So the, if you remember that old, that old woodworking slide that I placed, you have a half lap joint. You have a little bit of composite that is sitting on top of beveled enamel. This is a compression joint. If something hits this over here, it's not going to break. Whereas if you had it like this, where this is enamel and this is composite, and if you joint it like this, then it's going to break. Whereas this doesn't break. So that's the design change that you have to employ for a class one restoration. For a class two restoration, it becomes a big slope. If you see this picture over here, it's just one big slope. There is no box anymore. And the flare, the enamel that is there on the lingual side and the buccal side, or in this case, the palatal side is used. So it looks like a really wide inlay preparation with a lot more enamel being used than the dentine. So a wide enamel bevel is what is necessary. Make sure that there is enamel seen on the entire margin, especially in a class two situation because the gingival area, the gingival seat area of a class two becomes inaccessible after you've placed composite over there. So you have to look at it and see a little band of enamel over there. If you see a band of enamel, it's great for composite. If you don't see a band of enamel, it's not that great for composite. Just remember that. And you have to tell the patient that they will have to employ some very strict oral hygiene measures if you're going to give a composite restoration in that kind of a situation, all right? Now, you notice that whenever you start making slopes instead of boxes, all your preparations start looking like a class four. It is just a surface that you're bonding to. There are no side walls. It is just a surface and you're applying composite on top of it and your C factor becomes negligible. Now, it doesn't really matter if you bulk fill or you layer, doesn't really matter. In a situation like this, yes, if you use a bulk fill composite, it's great, not a problem. Your shrinkage stress is completely minimized because there is no C factor to worry about. A class three is almost like a partial veneer. Look at the extent of this preparation, okay? Now the actual, the actual cavity is there interproximally, that's all but then see the wide enamel coverage that is given. And this is a very, very thin bevel. It's not a sharp bevel. It's a very, very thin bevel, but it extends to almost the other side of the tooth. The advantage of doing something like this is that the margin of your restoration gets completely obscured. You will not be able to see it. That's number one. Number two, because you are placing it right on the labial surface, the patient can brush 
this restoration really well and he or she will keep it clean for you and prevent marginal staining as long as your polishing techniques have been good. Again, in this situation, the C factor is negligible. Now, moving on to the class four, the class four was always considered the best cavity design for composite. It was from here that people thought that, okay, can I make every cavity design of mine look like a class four? Then I reduce my C factor and it becomes great for composite, whether I layer or whether I bulk fill, it doesn't really matter. Again, when you look at this, the enamel bevel is wide. It's almost like a full veneer. And this is just a class four. Initially, we would make a 15 degree bevel just at the fracture line and just, you know, restore it over there. And then after some time, see that margin of discoloration that you see over there. When you place a margin right like this, you're not going to be able to see that margin. And your patients will be pretty happy with you also. A class five is looking at a veneer from the other way. A veneer you move from incisal to cervical. In a class five, you prepare from the cervical margin and push it up to almost the end of the middle third. All this enamel is what you need to use in order to retain a class five. Now in all the classes of restorations, the class five remains the most complicated and the most difficult. The reason being, it is bonding to dentine. Most of your class five, let's say, we'd say 99% of your class five restorations are lying wholly within dentine. So if you do not add enamel, if you do not include enamel into this equation, then this bond is going to fail in time. And believe me, I'm sure you would have experienced it many times, the dislodgement of a class five restoration. It's only because you have relied on dentine. It's not the substrate to rely on. You have to rely on enamel. A class five restoration is almost like a cantilever restoration. The enamel on top is supporting the dentine below. That's how the class five restoration should be designed. So this comes to the end of the beginning of my uh, uh, lecture today, which is on design of your cavity restoration. So the thing that I want you to remember is it is time to change the way you prepare a tooth for composite. Stop making boxes because composites don't like boxes and say goodbye to tension joints, welcome to compression joints and say hello to enamel. This is the present and this is going to be the future. Already in universities across America, they are starting to employ this technique and teach this at the university level to the students. And they're now moving completely away from the uh, black style of cavity preparation. Now, moving on to the second part of my lecture, it's about light curing. Now, light curing is this simple thing that we think we can do. The truth of the matter is nobody teaches us how to light cure. We observe and we copy. We observe and we copy. That is all. Most of you, a lot of your restorations fail because of improper curing and you don't know that because you've never actually thought about light curing from a engineering or a scientific way. Are there parameters to light curing? Is it important to understand what's going on with light curing? Is it important to choose the right light? All this is what I'm going to be discussing in the second half of my lecture. The factors that we will be discussing are the curing light characteristics, the depth of the cavity that you are making, does it play a role in curing? Yes, it does. The type of composite that you're curing makes a difference. And then finally, operator technique. So the curing light has, I've just simplified it a lot for you. Just remember these three things. The first one is irradiance. The second is a term called collimation. And the third is the actual design of the curing light. 
Now, irradiance is the energy of this light. So if you go back to your clinics and if you take your curing light and you switch it on and you place it, place the tip against your hand, you will find that there is some amount of heat being generated because this light that is coming out of your curing light contains energy. This energy is transferred into the composite and it's been uh, scientifically found out that composites require a certain amount of energy, 12 to 24 joules per centimeter squared. So what is a joule? It's milliwatts per centimeter squared into time. Then you get joules per centimeter squared. To simply put, you have a light of a particular energy. If you switch it on and you keep it on for X number of seconds, you multiply the number of seconds into the output energy of your light and you will get the amount of joules that your light is supplying to the composite. Now remember that you need from 12 to 24 joules per centimeter square. To make things simple, we just look at a 16 joules per centimeter square in between. So if the energy output of your light is 800 milliwatts and then you switch on this light for 20 seconds, just do a simple math calculation, you will get 16 joules per centimeter square. So if you have a composite light, which is outputting at 800 and you keep it at 20 seconds, only then will it be 16 joules per centimeter squared. If your light's irradiance is lower than 800, it doesn't mean that you have to throw your light off. It does mean that your curing time will have to increase to compensate for this energy requirement that the composite needs. Every composite needs some amount of energy in order to fully cure. So if your curing light is outputting at say 400 milliwatts and you follow the manufacturer's instructions by saying, I will cure for 20 seconds, then what you have actually delivered to the composite is only eight joules per centimeter square, not enough to cure the composite completely. That's why if your output is only 400, you may have to increase your time to 40 seconds. So it's a simple mathematical calculation if you know the energy output of your light. The second thing is collimation, which is how straight is your beam? Now this is a quality of the curing lights. And this is a completely manufacturer driven quality. Different curing lights from different manufacturers will have different collimation beams. So either it is how straight your beam is or how divergent your beam is. Now, if your beam is straight, that means, so if you look at this picture over here, it is a straight beam from one side to the other, which means that the entire radius of this beam is going to get the same amount of energy output. Whereas if you look at, say this picture over here, you will notice that only the center portion is straight and the radius is at a tangential angle, which means that all the composite that is lying around the tip or the outer surface of your curing light head is not going to get cured. Only the composite that is directly in the center of your curing light head is going to get cured. So if you have a light that you do a collimation test and if it looks like this, then please remember that what you have to do is cure for much longer time and cure around your restoration in different areas of your restoration. Now, I have a YouTube channel and uh, the uh, link is over here. Um, I call it the Coca-Cola challenge. It's something that you can do at home. Um, if you have a bottle of Coke, a glass of water and your curing light, you can test your curing light sitting at home and see whether the light beam that is coming out from it is collimated or not. It is a great way to understand whether your light is working properly and make the adjustment if you have a divergent curing light. If you have a divergent curing light, then please remember that your 20 second curing for a class two restoration at one point will not be enough to cure the restoration. Doesn't matter what the manufacturer says, your light is not functioning properly. Then we come to the design of the light. There are many, many designs available on the market today. 
all right? And if you look, remember earlier, they all came with a little curved tip so that you could reach into, into the mouth. We realized after some time that perhaps this curved tip design was not really the best thing to do because when it comes to curing, the head of your curing light or where the light outputs from has to be at 90 degrees to the restoration. So if you're looking at a curved tip design, then what happens is the patient's jaw has to open like a python almost, really wide in order to get that 90 degree inclined um, light falling on the uh, restoration. If the light falls at an angle, again, you're losing out on the energy potential of your light. The total energy of your light is going to drop and therefore you will have to start curing for much longer times if you don't achieve this 90 degree bang on the restoration way of placing your curing light head. Then there is the thing of depth of cavity. Now the class two cavity is probably the deepest cavity from the occlusal surface. Your curing light will stop at the occlusal surface. It cannot go into the cavity unless maybe you add some attachments that allow you, allows the light all the way in. But for um, just study purposes, let's think of a curing light head sitting at the occlusal uh, surface and the light is switched on. This is a very interesting study to show you what happens to the light. So at two millimeters away from the restoration, this is the beam profile of the light that you see. Okay, so the, the red areas are the good areas. This is where there is a lot of heat in the light and there's a lot of energy that is coming out. So wherever you see a red area, that means it's nice or an orange area. Now this is at four millimeters. You will see that the orange area is slowly disappearing. And this is at eight millimeters. This light is absolutely useless. So if you're doing something like this, you've placed one layer of the composite and your curing light is sitting eight millimeters away from the composite, whatever light that you apply over here is useless. You can cure for as long as you want. What will happen is just the top surface of this composite will cure, the bottom surface will not be cured at all. This will lead to micro leakage, this will lead to sensitivity, and then you end up bl blaming the composite. You never once think that perhaps it is my curing technique which is wrong. I haven't been able to optimize my curing so that the composite gets cured from top to bottom. So if you have a large or, or, or a, 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 a cavity which is quite deep, then what you have to do nowadays is to place a thin layer because thin layers will cure with a little bit of light. Thick layers will not. So you have to put a thin layer and reduce this to about four millimeters. At four millimeters, you can cure full depth, no problem. But if your cavity um, depth is greater than four millimeters, then you will have to start layering in thin layers to bring it up back to four millimeters and then do a full cure. Or you can put composite right through if you want to do a bulk fill. If you're already doing layering, doesn't matter. But just make sure that the layers are around two millimeters or less, less is better. Finally, we come to the type of composite. Now, initially, when manufacturers made composite, they were using a substance called camphoroquinone. We learned this when we had to study the composition of composite. The photoinitiator is camphoroquinone and it absorbs light at a particular wavelength. That is 460 nanometers, maybe 470, 480 nanometers, all in that range. So whatever light that is hitting the composite, and if there is camphoroquinone inside the composite, it will take up only the light in that particular wavelength. Now, people found out that since camphoroquinone is yellow in color, it could possibly be the reason why composites yellow over time. So newer composites were manufactured where the amount of camphoroquinone was reduced and newer photo initiators are added like Lucerin TPO. 
Now the problem is that Lucerne TPO does not accept light at 460 nanometers. At 460 nanometers, you're looking at nice blue light. At 375 to 410 nanometers, you're going into the violet spectrum. So does your curing light enable you to cure at both 460 as well as 375 to 410? That really depends on your curing light. Most curing lights are mono wavelength. That is 460. They're designed for camphoroquinone. Some, very, very few, have the dual wavelength incorporated in them. They are very expensive, unfortunately. But the advantage is that if you don't know what composite you're using, and let's say you're using a composite that has lucerin TPO in the mixture, that lucerin TPO initiator is not going to get activated at all with your existing curing light. So when you do a spectrum analysis of your curing light, you should see two peaks, the 375, 410 peak and the 460 to 480 peak. This is a kind of um, spectrum analysis that should be done. And then you will know whether your curing light is curing at dual wavelengths or not. If it is not curing at dual wavelengths, just remember when you buy composite, please check. Just check whether it is camphoroquinone based or whether or not they've added TPO lucerin into the mixture. Stay away from that if your curing light does not have a dual wavelength. Now, lastly, let's look at the operator technique. Protection of the eyes is very important because this light that is coming out is extremely, extremely strong and prolonged uh, viewing of this blue light will lead to retinal damage. There have been many papers written on it. So please take uh, adequate protection. Yeah, protection seems to be like the big word today. There's one more thing to add to your list. Now, <clears throat> a lot of curing lights come with a shield. The one little orange cover that sleeve that you push through your curing light, that really doesn't work. What you need to get is either you get this orange goggles, quite cheap, I think Decathlon has it, or um, what you do is you get this nice orange plate that you can cover completely over the tooth and cure. These modern curing lights are pretty hot. They're very, very hot. So you bring the curing light to, the, to your hand and switch it on, you will realize there is a lot of heat being generated. So when you're curing, have your assistant blow air with a three-way syringe. That will reduce the amount of heat that goes into the restoration. <clears throat> Another part of operator technique, as I said earlier, is to align the light head to 90 degrees. Now this really depends on the design of your curing light. If your curing light does not allow you to sort of keep it at 90 degrees, then you will have to cure for a much, much longer time because your light that is coming out is not optimum or you will have to tell the patient to open the jaw really wide in order to get that in for the 20 seconds that is there. Now, this is a, is a topic that not many people know, that light curing is actually a two-handed technique. It is not a one-handed technique. If you think that you can stabilize the light head with just one hand, think again. You need to ha have your other hand either holding the tooth in question that you're restoring or place it against the head of the light curing gun so that you stabilize it. I'll show this to you in a little video that I took in the college where I teach. Um, I was doing a composite restoration and uh, I gave the curing light to one of the interns and I said, cure the tooth. So the intern just took it and then held it like that and cured it. And then I shot a little video of what is happening to the light head during curing. After that, I told him what he's supposed to do and then said, cure again. And I took another video. And you will see the difference between the two by yourself. So this is what I called Alice in Wonderland. This is what we do if you're doing single-handed composite curing. You can see how that light head is moving. Now here you will see 
how the finger stabilizes the light head. And now look at what happens. My camera is moving, yes, but the light head is remaining rock steady. This is a very, very simple modification to your technique that you're using for composites, whether it is anteriors or posteriors. Use another finger, the thumb or the index finger, support the curing light. And you will find that your curing technique improves vastly. And I said earlier, if you're curing or deeper cavities, then you might have to have a longer exposure or you'll have to do multiple exposures. Now, if you um, use a mylar matrix strip or a polycarbonate matrix, which allows light to pass through, then you can cure from the top and you can cure from the sides because light will pass through the matrix band and then hit the um, composite from the bottom also. So that is an advantage of using, instead of metal matrix bands, if you move on to mylar matrix bands or uh, polycarbonate matrix bands, it allows you to cure in deeper cavities quite easily. Whenever you place a plastic sleeve on your composite head, uh, curing light head, just remember that this plastic sleeve sometimes has a seam. And if this seam goes over the light head, then this is the beam profile that you get. Right in the center where the seam goes through, there is no light that passes through. So you're actually making your curing light ineffective. So remember when you pass a sleeve over your curing light, keep the seam away from the light head. And then finally, pay attention. If you are curing, keep looking at the tooth and nothing but the tooth. Don't get distracted by anything that is happening. I know there is a tendency for resistance to give you the phone just when you are curing. Otherwise, nobody will call you. But just when you uh, start pressing that light cure unit, somebody calls you, you're looking somewhere else, you're distracted, but even for a few seconds, it's gone. That light head is going to move. So this is a video that uh, a friend of mine from uh, Chennai sort of posted on our endo group. And I told her that, listen, I would be using your video. It's from BBC and it's the video of Fisher. And I think this is the kind of attention that we need when we are light curing. Despite the wind, despite the movement of the branch, Look at the steadiness of that head of the kingfisher. That is what you should be aiming for when you light cure. So to summarize what I've said today, your preparation design has to change. Make it enamel centric with a wide enamel bevel preparation and use compression joints and not tension joints for the longevity of your restoration. Light curing is a two-handed technique. Curing light energy is important. Protect your eyes and be a kingfisher. Thank you very much for patient listening. And uh, this is my YouTube channel. It's called The Dental Center. Every once in a while, I tend to put up some videos um, that may help you in clinical practice. Um, if you are so inclined, please feel free drop in and I would love it if you asked a question or two um, on YouTube too. And now I think my, prep, my presentation is done. I will close now and um, we'll go into uh, questioning. Thank you, Johan Chako, for your nice uh, presentation. It was very informative. All small, small things you have said uh, about the light curing and the cavity preparation. Uh, the session is open for questions now. You can post it in the WhatsApp group or in the YouTube. I have not received any questions till now. Just we wait for some time. Oh, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there any method for checking the, I mean, uh, intensity of the light cure? Um, well, there are light yeah, meters. Simple, simple, simple methods. Any simple okay. methods. Okay. So if you really want to uh, test your the efficacy of your light cure unit, then what I would suggest is, um, is there any method for checking the, I mean, uh, intensity of the light cure? Yeah. So, um, well, there are light meters. Simple, simple, simple methods. Right. So, um, okay, what's happening, Faisal, is that I think I'm hearing myself again. Yeah, my, me too. I have some technical so issues. If you, if you ask the question and then mute your microphone, I think it should yeah, be Yeah, that would be better. Yes. yes. So, coming to this uh, first question on if there is any simple technique to test your curing light sitting at home the uh, intensity of your curing light. Um, not really the intensity, but then you can test the efficacy of your curing light by doing something called a simple scratch test, which means that you take uh, on, a, on a glass slab, you take a little bit of composite and you pat a little circle to approximately two millimeters and you bring your light on top and you cure it. And then you take your uh, probe and you scratch the top surface of it and then you go to the underside and you scratch the underside of it. If the underside is getting scratched, that means your curing light efficacy is not that great. Now this you can increase from two millimeters to three millimeters to four millimeters to see how much depth can you go with the curing light that you have in your clinic without actually getting a light meter. So this is one simple um, technique that you can use. Yeah, Johan, one more question. One more question is there. Curing light efficacy is not that great. Now this you can increase from two millimeters to three millimeters to four millimeters. Can, can, can you mute now? How much depth can yeah, okay, you fine. go? What I've done is actually I've gone to uh, in your clinic without I've gone to the getting YouTube, a light meter. Uh, so this is one simple. I've gone to the YouTube uh, link. Yeah, I just uh, can you close that YouTube link? You want me to close the close yeah. close the oh, link? The YouTube YouTube link. Keep only the yeah. Zoom link. Done. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll ask the next question now. Is it necessary to cure from buccally and lingually as well as occlusally for a class two cavity restoration? I think so. I think it is very necessary to cure from occlusal and buccal and lingual. The three point curing technique improves the efficiency of your curing and leaves behind a composite restoration that is much, much better cured than just relying on occlusal curing. So yes, you need a three-point curing. Unfortunately, with metal matrices, you cannot achieve a three-point curing. The only way you can achieve a three-point curing is to cure from the top, then carefully remove the ring, and then sort of push the metal matrix band slightly and then cure. But it's a hell of a uh, jugglery technique over there. It's much better to get a polycarbonate uh, see-through matrix band, place it over there, cure from top, and from the sides. Dr. Johan, can we use metal bands for composite restorations? Yes, you can use metal bands for composite restorations. The only restriction that I would see is that you cannot do a three-point cure with metal bands. So therein lies a problem. So if you're going to do, um, um, let's say a class three or a class four or even a class five with a metal band, it's fine in my opinion. Yes, even I, I, I use it once in a while, especially for my class five. I just take a metal band and I turn it around in a shape of U and I place it over there and I use it. But for a class two, I don't think I would ever go back to using a metal band again. Having known that the advantage of using a polycarbonate band 
I won't go back. It's still on mute. I think uh, we don't have any other questions from our participants. Okay. I once again thank you very much for being here with us for giving you this very nice lecture. I thank you. Kerala State is very thankful to you for attending for uh, giving you this lecture, giving us this lecture. Thank you very much, Johan. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much. Thank you, Friday. Yeah. Bye bye and happy Sunday. Bye. Long long day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye bye.